and welcome to the final Backyard Farmer of the season. I'm your host, Kim Todd. We are joining you from Midwest Top Producers here in Plattsmouth. It is great to have our audience and of course, everybody who loves our show. This is a taped show, so unfortunately, we will not be taking your calls tonight. However, you can still send us those emails at byf.unl. at byfunledu. But make sure you attach those pictures as JPEGs. We're going to take a little bit of a hiatus to answer those questions because we have a big backlog, but we will get back to them. You can also follow us on the off season, of course, on all those social media sites. Facebook, Twitter, Pinterest, you name it, they probably are gonna come up with one we haven't even heard of yet. So we always start our show with samples, and Jim, you have some wiggly worms for us. Beautiful wiggly worms, and entomology is very, pretty simple as a discipline. Uh, so when we have a worm like this that has a little horn at the back of its body, it's called a hornworm. And so this happens to be one that's fairly rare for our area. This is called a spurge hawk moth. And it's actually from Europe, and it was released years ago, decades ago, to help control leafy spurge in the landscape, mostly up north in, mostly up north in North Dakota. And uh, we happen to have a case here, Virginia Wright in Lincoln, Nebraska, happened to be growing some donkey tail spurge related to leafy spurge, and these were all over her plants. And so we thought, wow, Eureka, we found some here. And so we got some nice, colorful spurge hawk moths. They play a role in helping to control leafy spurge, but they're also very pretty. So I don't know if these are going to survive in Nebraska. I think they will do just fine because there are alternative spurges. So um, I just wanted to show you what they look like. They're kind of related to the white line sphinx moth that we have uh, in our landscape here in Nebraska, too. So I happen to have an unfortunate one, just to show you that people get diseases and insects get diseases too. So we have one that looks like it's alive, but it looks like it's also stuffed with something. And yes, it is, it's a fungal disease. It is just packed tightly with fungal hyphae. I think that uh, Kyle might get really excited about this. I but do. Uh, <laughs> you could just about put that in a museum. It's gonna stay preserved that way. So I just wanted to introduce that to you because it's a kind of a rarity that was new to us. And on that donkey tail spurge note, it's a scourge on the spurge, right? Yeah. Okay, mm -hmm. good. <laughs> All right, Bill, your sample. Yeah, I actually have uh, three different uh, grassy weeds here tonight. Um, and these are ones that we are seeing a lot of in the state right now. And uh, these are ones that haven't been mowed. So one of the things that's a challenge of identifying grasses is knowing uh, what uh, grass you have. And, and when you have a seed head, it's really helpful. So the first grass that we have here is, um, is foxtail. You, you can tell by the big seed head on it. This is an annual grass. And then the, uh, the other big grass here is one we're generally used to seeing as a smaller grass in a landscape. And it's very really distinctive because it has a very white coloration of the leaves down by the crown. Uh, this is goosegrass, but when it actually goes to seed, it makes this kind of distinctive and cool looking uh, seed head. And then another grass that could look very similar to these two is, uh, is yellow nuts edge. Also has an interesting seed head, which I broke off, unfortunately, right before the show went live today. But you'll know this one is different because when you roll it through your fingers, you'll feel the triangular stem. And the importance here is, you know, this is a time where you look at what grassy weeds do you have or what weeds you have in your landscape. And then you figure out, okay, these are annuals. They can be controlled with a pre-emergence herbicide um, next spring. But this one, uh, this yellow nut sedge, is a perennial. It's going to survive in these little nutlets, they're called, down in the soil. And so you're going to need a different management option if your lawn has this. So this is the time of year where we want to assess what problems we have, try to fix it in the fall, and then prepare to uh, prevent it next year. All right. Thanks, Bill. All right, Kyle, no foliage left on what No that. foliage left. So now this is one of those, those times when I'm probably better at IDing this plant than Kim is. <laughs> well, so this, yeah. <laughs> but these are some peonies that we had. And if we did have the leaves there, you would be able to tell that. But these were some peonies from, um, from, you know, from city campus, actually. And they just got completely overrun by a fungal pathogen, um, Phytophthora, with all the rain that we had this past about two weeks ago. We had 10 inches of rain over the course of about a week. This was already an irrigated situation. And over the course of about three days, these plants went from looking great 
to being completely defoliated. And on one side, there's this nice black streak that extends down to the soil line. But then the other side is still, is still pretty nice and green. But when we cut that open, we see all of this rot inside of the, inside of the stem and down into the crown. <coughs> and that is typical of, of, any, of, our of any of our rots, um, but this one is Phytophthora, Phytophthora cactorum in this case. As far as control, unfortunately, this, this pathogen infects over 200 different species of plants, so rotating is not really the best option. But anything you can do to really decrease uh, moisture or standing water in the area will greatly help cut down on any of these water molds like Phytophthora. So uh, irrigation management, uh, decreasing water, or any, if you are able to, to kind of break up that soil, maybe you have a hard pan layer that's leading to more compaction layer, or more compaction, and now you have standing water in the area. So Mother Nature's six or eight inches didn't help us at all? No, Mother Nature caused this and uh, is laughing at us now. <laughs> right. <laughs> all right. Okay, John, you have an edible or not, maybe, for your sample. Right. So uh, first off, I wanted to say I'm very proud of myself. I'm not a turf person, but I knew that that was a sedge. Like, did you, do you know the poem? Like, sedges have edges, rushes are round, and grasses have leaves that go all the way down. Right? Whoa! Well, there we go. So, so I'll, I talked to you a little something about turf there. No, you Bill. did, you did. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> so I have uh, a flowering kale or flowering cabbage. It's coming out in uh, garden centers this time of year. And it's actually one of my favorite uh, fall plants to put in your landscape. Number one, because it is related to those edible plants and I'm all about the fruits and vegetables. And this is kale. So uh, if you uh, really want to eat it, you can. So see right there. If you like kale, you know, it tastes like kale. Uh, so, uh, uh, so the nice thing about it is you can plant it now with your mums and it'll be that nice fall plant, but it also survives well uh, past, you know, the mums whenever we're getting into the freeze and frost. And it, it pairs well with pansies and things like that for the winter. So I love putting this in the landscape. Uh, you can buy them at garden centers. You can get seeds and start them earlier in the summer like you're doing a fall crop almost. So. Uh, take a look for that uh, fall, fall uh, flowering kale or flowering cabbage. Excellent. Thank you so much. And no, we are not going to eat that. Oh, come on now. No, no, nope, not <laughs> happening. It's not quite as bad as aronia, but close. Right. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So we're going to go to picture questions. Jim, you actually have three questions here. Okay. They're all related. Um, the first is an Omaha viewer who found these insects on the milkweed. milkweed. Are they good or bad? The second is, I love this, he titled them college bugs. Is this what aphids look like when they're all grown up and going off to college? So let's start with those Both two of first. those are mm. called large milkweed, milkweed beetles, and so it's natural that you would expect to find them on milkweed, the wild varieties, as well as the ornamental cultivated kinds. So you're always going to have them. If you don't want them, you know, move them to the nearest milkweed plants further away. These are all nymphs. Uh, they're not ready to fly yet, or just simply remove them if they're putting too much stress on the plant. They love to feed on those developing pods, and if you, we don't really value the wild pods, so uh, let them have at it, but make sure you can pull those things off before the season ends. All right, and your third okay. question related is this is a Norfolk viewer who checked on the milkweeds and found this insect that looked like it had just eaten uh, milk. Yeah, th out of this is a tragic scene, really, really tragic. Uh, although we would laud both of them, we laud the milkweed, uh, I mean the monarch caterpillar because it feeds on milkweed. We love monarchs and we want to propagate them, help them increase population and so they're always going to be with us. That's a wonderful thing to do. The other insect is called either a spine soldier bug or it's the two-spotted soldier bug. Both of those are stink bugs that are predaceous, so it's feeding on the, the monarch caterpillar. It couldn't tell, but uh, <laughs> anyway, that does happen in nature, and so there's plenty of monarchs, and we do really value the soldier bugs for what they do in killing caterpillars. Maybe we can educate them sometime a little bit better, but that's the way it is right now. All right, thanks, Jim. All right, Bill, uh, this is a viewer who had this particular grass invade. He says it's actually seeding itself into the edges of his lawn. 
He's yeah. wondering what it is and then it, what can we do to keep this This is from a particularly uh, problematic ornamental fountain grass. Uh, this is Penicetum. Kim knows exactly which Penicetum it might be with their ornamental background. And, uh, Mm -hmm. But uh, it's a challenge. Most of our ornamental plants can't handle the regular mowing or defoliation that they're under, and so they don't really invade. But fountain grass, the seed is, it can be prolific of a cedar. The seed can go into the lawns, and then we can have problems with it uh, starting to germinate and then starting to grow. And so fountain grass can be a, a lot of a, a pretty much of a challenge. Uh, a non-selective approach does work. So if you wanted to use some kind of a non-selective herbicide, you could try to uh, kill it that way. Um, there are some selective approaches that can be um, effective, but you're generally going to need two applications to control it. Um, products like Drive or Quincorac for crabgrass, two applications of that can help. And then also a herbicide Q4, two applications can do a pretty good job. Um, may kill most, but not all of them. So uh, there are some options out there for control, but it really is becoming a challenge to control in our lawns. Exactly, and that's one of the reasons we're so cautious about some of those introduced plants. Yeah, definitely. Thanks, Bill. All right, so Kyle, your question comes to us from Imperial Ooh. on a farm. This is a viewer who says she has never missed an episode of Backyard Farmer oh, wow. since the Wayne Whitney years. Um, she has an autumn blaze maple all the way out there in the western part of the state. She has been treating it for what sounds like iron chlorosis in, a, in both an expensive and a good way. But now she is wondering if there are other issues associated with the, this tree. Yeah, so it, it is good that you are tr uh, doing the iron chlorosis treatment, especially out in western Nebraska. We do see a lot of, a lot of issues with iron chlor chlorosis. But I think there's something else going on with this, with this maple. Um, the leaves are, the, there is some leaf scorch going on, but I don't really know what's causing that leaf scorch. I'm going to guess that if you would follow that, those branches back, to the main trunk, you will see some sort of canker, something like that, as you, as you follow those branches back. This is a great time of year to be looking for any sort of cankers in your landscape or any sort of tree issues, because those will be those branches on, of the trees that are turning colors faster than all the others. So if you see that one or two branches that are turning red um, right now and all the rest is still green, chances are there is some sort of canker, uh, canker issue. And with this maple, I'm thinking that's what's going on too. All right, thank you, Kyle. You have a couple of interesting ones, John. The first Always. is a viewer from Clarkson who has potatoes that look like they had no, they wanted to be a ginger root. They're all knobby, so that's your first one. What's going on with that? So I think, so one thing that can happen with potatoes is if you have a lot of um, obstacles in the soil, uh, you have lots of rocks, or if you have uh, heavy soils, they can have these weird growth patterns. I think that's some of what's going on. Uh, sometimes you can actually uh, have too much organic matter in the soil too, and that can lead to some of those weird growth. So I think uh, there, there are a few things going on there. So I think they're still perfectly edible. Uh, just don't try to, I mean, they're gonna be a, a pain to try to peel. <laughs> All right, thanks. And your second one is actually a correction last week, which was uh, we thought there was an autocorrect to mouse melon to musk melon. It was in fact, mouse melons right and uh, this viewer has sent us a picture of it what can you tell our viewers about growing mouse melons so uh, the other term for this is called mexican sour gherkin and it's a really neat little plant so it is a cucumber relative uh, they look like tiny little watermelons about the size of your thumb uh, and they're great to grow uh, <laughs> especially if you have kids uh, they they ha sort of have that cucumbery taste but they're very sour almost a lemony flavor uh, so you can, you can start them easily from seed, uh, grow them in your garden. It's a prolific uh, grower, and so you want to trellis it uh, very well, just like you would like a, a cucumber or something like that. Uh, but they're a very interesting uh, plant, so give them a try. All right, excellent. Thanks, John. Well, we are on location at Midwest Tops Producers in Plattsmouth, Nebraska today on a beautiful, beautiful day. In 2013, there was a vision, innovation, a collaboration between Nebraska hops or Midwest hops producers and Nebraska Extension that resulted in this beautiful opportunity.
reached out to the university to talk to them about what opportunities were available for specialty crops. There were some hobby growers here in Nebraska, and so we knew they could grow well, but nobody had commercially grown. Once we put the first varieties in um, and then reached out to them and told them what our long-term plans were, things started to work from there. Hops, they're a really attractive plant to grow, um, and you do it right you can receive quite a bit of profit from it, but there's a significant amount of work that goes into it, and it can be quite challenging. For us, starting a new crop in the state, there wasn't a lot of people to go talk to or history um, to work from, so um, from the beginning, the university has been helpful in all those areas. We're constantly learning. Every day I go out in the field, I learn something different. We were able to evaluate the different cultivars and how they performed agronomically just kind of trying to stay one step ahead of the curve. The first year when we were open, we focused specifically on the ag. Once we got enough brewers that were using our hops, uh, we opened the tasting room up and we rotate the taps because we've got so many brewers now that are brewing with the hops. We're able to also promote them as well and using a local product and then be able to serve that product here at the yard where those ingredients come from. It's a great relationship. The best part of post-harvest is having those hops brewed in a beer um, sitting out here at the hop yard with that brewer um, and drinking that beer and talking about how the Nebraska terroir um, has a special um, effect on those hops and the flavoring and what it does to the beer. Terroir um, is something that we learned about um, when we started growing because some of the aromas that come off of our hops are truly different than what we find in the Pacific Northwest. It's the soil, it's the climate, um, it's the region. It could be the difference between a hop growing on a hill versus a hop growing on the bottom. And that all plays into the flavor and the profile of what you get out of that plant. As they've expanded their operation here, they've looked at the ones that have done well, they've spoken to brewers, and the ones that the brewers really want, they've expanded on that. The craft beer industry really took off a few years before the hop industry took off, and trying to create the volume that the brewers need and create the quality that they've been buying from you know, the Pacific Northwest or from Germany or from elsewhere. So we're still building up to that and Midwest is really leading that charge as far as creating that quality product. We consider ourselves almost a, a craft hobby grower, I would say, similar to the craft brewers. So there's a lot of specialization that we put into what we're doing and I think the Nebraska brewers appreciate that. The machinery and the infrastructure have really been a challenge, but Annette and her team have done a wonderful job of putting this together, really making this a new part of the ag sector in the state of Nebraska, probably the Midwest Great Plains, and let's just go global with the thing, especially for those of us who like beer. All right, Jim, so we have an interesting question, a couple of pictures. This okay. is actually from Hancock, Iowa. They have found this on a dreadful vine called Smilax, uh, and they're wondering what it is. They've never seen it before. They say the vine is slimy under these insects. Okay. They cut it up and burned it. <clears throat> yeah, uh, I don't know what Smilax is related to, uh, but these look like either they're woolly apple aphids or woolly alder apple aphids, which also get on maple. So Smilax, they may know what it's related to. I should, but I don't. It's okay. Catbriar. But anyway, yeah. they have alternative hosts, and this looks like this is the so-called alternative host before they fly back to their original host. So it's a woolly um, aphid group, and usually they don't cause any harm other than just being amazingly dense on branches. It can cause a little bit of dieback, but they usually don't seem to affect the health of any trees or host plants that they're on. Yeah, and her bigger issue is gonna be getting rid of the cat briar or the, or the yeah. smile. Oh, yeah. <laughs> All right, so we have a Lincoln viewer here, Bill. His question is, he has this lawn that is pretty dead oh, within yeah. about two weeks in some stripes and some circles. So what do we think is going on here? 
Yeah, with all the rain that we've had and the warm soils, um, there's a couple of things that could have been causing this. But the one thing to me that I, catches my eye are these stripes. So we can see where the low areas are, are kind of really sunken and have this kind of purple dead color to it. And then we see the it's streaking across the lawn. And one of the diseases that we can really easily spread when it's really wet is Pythium blight, especially when you're mowing when the soil is very wet. And we don't see it on lawns a lot, but we also don't get eight inches of rain very often in a matter of a couple weeks in August, and, or a couple days in August. So uh, I think that could be what this is. Unfortunately, the damage has been done. Hopefully this drier weather now is gonna allow the, the grass to recover. If it's a bluegrass lawn, there's gonna be rhizomes that will help to recover. Um, anything you can do to try to manage, the, uh, to, to promote healthy turf is really gonna help you know, get this grass ready for the, the winter uh, and then look good for next year. All right, and Kyle, you're nodding your head in agreement yeah. on that yep. one. Yeah, you know, yeah. Pythium on turf tends to get kind of a greasy appearance when you go into the, to, to where that infection first started. And yeah, just like Bill was describing it, moves spread, spread very easily in these wet temperatures. All right. You don't have a turf Pythium question. Okay. You actually have, this is a Lincoln viewer who has an Ann Magnolia, which is one of the hybrids. Um, developed this issue that she has never seen before on Magnolia. And I know we have Ann and Jane and all the girl sisters on campus. I don't know that we have seen this either. Yeah, um, it's Magnolia can get a few different leaf spots. I'm not entirely sure what, what this one is. Um, f my guess is Phyllosticta leaf spot. Um, as, we, as I looked, zoomed in on some of the pictures, I saw some kind of fruiting bodies inside of those lesions, which is typical of Phyllosticta. Um, but really, to be certain, I would need to see a sample. So I would encourage them, them to send a sample into the diagnostic clinic. But regardless of, of any of our fungal leaf spots, this time of year, control is not really going to be too necessary, typically. Um, the, the plants are, they're, getting, they're slowing down, they're getting, ready to, getting ready, ready to go dormant. And so a lot of these, a lot of these other fungal pathogens, they can come and cause some infection right now. For this one, I'd recommend maybe doing some pruning and then some, fall, um, some big fall sanitation as well. It looked like there were quite a few diseased leaves on the ground. Try to remove those and then next year, hopefully we won't have these leaf spots coming back. All right, thank you, Kyle. All right, John, this sounds like it belongs to Kyle, but it, the real question is yours. So this is an Ainsworth viewer who has pumpkins that develop the white spots, spread through the patch, leaves right. turned yellow and croaked. What she's really wondering is, is there anything they can do now? And then should they go ahead and harvest those pumpkins and gourds because there's no foliage left? Right. Well, this late in the season and with so much damage, there's not really anything you can do now that's powdery mildew. Uh, so if you catch it earlier in the season, you can sort of slow it spread down with some fungicide treatments to, you know, you're never going to totally eliminate it. You're just going to slow it down. Uh, the question as to whether you can harvest them now, if they're mature and ready to be harvested, uh, you can go ahead and do that. So if they're orange and the stem has sort of, sort of started to turn a little bit brown, you could go ahead and do that. Um, the problem is that if they're not mature, uh, pumpkins are a non-climacteric fruit. So a climacteric fruit means that it ripens after you pick it. So if you pick a tomato green and you set it on your kitchen counter, it'll turn red. Pumpkins don't do that. So that's one issue with that. All right, thank you, John. All right, guys, we're gonna go to just some regular questions. Um, this is a viewer, Jim, who has caterpillars on the leaves of her water lilies in her pond. She wants to know, is there any way to get rid of the caterpillars without hurting the pond ecosystem? Mm. Okay, the only thing that we can think of probably is that Bacillus thuringiensis that kills caterpillars, but that would be assuming that the caterpillars are pretty young because they'd be more susceptible to it. So there are caterpillars that do feed on those pads, those water lily pads. It's kind of interesting that there's a community of insects that take advantage of that resource. Um, I would say, the other way is just simply try as much as you can to pick them off, um, drown them or whatever, but, but that's about the only thing that you can do. All right, thank you, Jim. Mm -hmm. All right, Bill, um, this is a viewer who wants to know whether he or she can combine these products to create a concentrate that he can use on the weeds in his bluegrass lawn, huh? and it's Quinclorac, Triclopyr, and 240. <laughs> um, 
the triclopyr and the 2,4-D are usually mixed together. Um, I haven't really seen it with quinclorac, and so if it's not compatible, um, usually you can, uh, it'll be on the label. So read all the labels first and make sure that it doesn't say it's not compatible with this. And if, it, if you don't see anything there, then do what we call it's a jar test. You take a little bit of each one, you put it in the water. If it doesn't make a kind of a soup in that water and uh, kind of coagulate together, then you're, you're okay. But that's just the one thing you want to do is check compatibility of the products, but also first read that label. And if the label doesn't say anything specifically, do that jar test. If it comes back and you know it just seems like liquid, then you can use that combination to control your, your weeds. All right, yep. thank you, Bill. Okay, Kyle, um, I don't know, 100 questions like this. Okay. This one's from Bellevue. Um, puff balls in the yard, and they're, some are the size of baseballs. They push the turf up, they split mm -hmm. open, there's a star in the top. They dig up every year, they refill the holes, they come back every year, they yep. refill. <laughs> so what can be done, if anything? Well, not a, mushrooms in the lawn are pretty difficult, difficult to control. They are, they're just feeding on other, probably some uh, wood tissue that's down below. So they're decomposing something, whether it's an old tree, roots of a tree, they're, they're working on something. It can be, fungicides don't work too great to spray in the lawn because, the, again, the, the main part of this fungus is going to be a couple of feet down in the soil where that wood is. Up on the top, we're only seeing a small part of it. It's kind of like an iceberg. That mushroom is just that top part of the iceberg where all the rest of it is down below. One thing that can kind of speed up de decomposition of wood in the, in the soil though, is to use, um, to, to um, increase your fertilizer program. And so extra nitrogen has been shown to help, help break down wood um, in, in lawns and turf. And so if increasing your fertilization, then that should, um, or may help de or may help you uh, break down some of that wood faster, not have the mushrooms, but really anytime we have again ten inches of rain and nice temperatures, they're probably going to pop up. So just enjoy them while they're here and don't eat them. So that and on the lawn means you get to mow more, which means you don't have to go to the gym. Exactly. There you go. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, so John, uh, this is a Springfield viewer, wants to know when they should plant their spring flowering bulbs. So when you should plant your spring flowering bulbs. So most of those are fall planted. So they're in the store right now. Uh, you can get them now. If you really need to plant them now, you could go ahead, but really it's better if you could wait a little bit longer. So it really depends on what you're trying to do. So when it cools down, the, those cool temperatures are what's gonna help them to develop their flowers that are gonna spring, uh, spring forward in the spring. And since we're being poetic, we always say, put down the roots, don't send up the shoots. Right. That's what you're after for temperature, sirs. All right, Jim, you get the next picture. This is not so beautiful. Uh, this is actually a viewer from Kearney. She's been having multiple problems with her strawberries. She noticed what she thought was ant hills encasing the bases of the stems, but sprayed it off, but reappeared. Leaves are covered, then the They've produced really well. The berries, though, are not filling right. Then she cuts them open and she finds tiny little eighth-inch insects that have snouts and a little, I mean, yuck. And she's treated with piola and some things like that. Wow. What, is she, what should she be There's doing There's a here? lot going on in those yeah. strawberries. Yeah. Uh, I'm not sure I can answer everything, that everything is an entomological kind of a uh, solution. But the ants themselves, of course, they're going to disrupt some of that crown and root system. They may be tending aphids as well, which will sap the plants of some of their energy. That's one possibility. And so as long as the ants are there, the, that will keep happening. Um, the shrunken berries that I saw look like they could possibly be the effect of um, um, tarnished plant bug feeding injury or maybe some stink bugs but they will feed on the developing fruit and that will cause that area to, sh to not to grow. It actually will be scarred and so you'll have misshapen fruit that doesn't even turn color or only, only portions of it might turn color. So um, I don't know what those little, uh, little weevil-like critters are in there too. Uh, man, uh, there's a lot going on, like I said. But possibly there might be some renovation that might be necessary. I know John might be able to add a little bit to that because the, the better that we kind of 
cult, you know, culture the strawberries and properly in their beds and the like. Uh, keep the ants away, you know, that kind of thing. And we can't really control the ants in the bed, so maybe a uh, renovation might be in order there. And since I totally forgot my brain, plant of the week. Right, plant of the week, right? So now. Uh, now. So <laughs> we have two plants of the week. So uh, we have a little uh, pretty from the backyard farmer garden. This is Lespediza. So it is a, uh, a nice uh, pink fuchsia color. It's a legume, so it's a nitrogen fixture, so it's nice to be in the garden. And uh, some f uh, farmers might know this because it's actually uh, sometimes used as like a forage or a, even a hay plant. Uh, so uh, you can look, this is a Gibraltar is the variety that this one is. Uh, but we're in a hops yard, so I thought, why not talk about hops? So here we have the, the hops. Uh, so this, the scientific name is Humulus lupulus. <laughs> So say that five times fast, right? Humulus lupulus. Uh, so the, it's a medieval name, the, the humulus is. Lupulus means little wolf. Hmm. Uh, and it's because it's such a fast, rapid grower that it will take over other plants around it. So it's called little wolf. Uh, it's in a very uh, well-known plant family, family uh, Cannabinaceae. So it has a very famous relative that isn't legal to grow in most states, mm -hmm. right? So, uh, so it's uh, very herbal. It produces different oils in these cones. Uh, so these are harvested and this is uh, put in beer and that's, those oils are what give beer its bitter properties. So if you like a hoppy beer, it's that really bitter taste. If you don't like a hoppy beer like me, you prefer fewer hops in your beer. Sounds excellent. Thanks for doing that and thanks for the rescue. Right. So, Bill, now it's your turn for pictures. Okay. Mm -hmm. And this is actually a Foster, Nebraska viewer. He has, he has this growing along his driveway edges. He wonders what this particular thing is. Is it a weed or is it something to be kept? Yeah, we think this is a, a purple lovegrass. Um, it's a perennial grass. Um, it's kind of distinctive by its, its seed heads. They're really small. They're, they're kind of really extended off. And so, again, a lot easier to identify a grass uh, when, it's, when it goes to seed like this. Um, this is a perennial, a perennial grass. Um, sometimes it can be confused. Sometimes you say love grass, and people think stink grass. It's an annual. That would be one that if you, you cut it or break it, it will actually stink. Uh, and there's another one too that it could be, which is tufted love grass. Um, we think this is purple. It just hasn't really turned purple yet. Uh, but this is a, a perennial grass that uh, you might see in that landscape. All right, and it is one that can be really ornamental. Yeah, I mean, it looks pretty nice. Yeah. All right, uh, Kyle. This is a viewer who has Norway spruce. She's in Council Bluffs. This is kind of a stumper. She looked for insects. She looked for bagworms. She looked for brown. Instead, she's seeing this grayish black in the interior of the branches on this particular spruce. OK. So any ideas on this one? Yeah, um, I think that right here we're dealing with Cytospora canker on this spruce. Um, it Look cl close to some of the pictures and we see there's kind of a whitish grayish kind of pitch or tar that looks like it's coming out of the bark. And that is a sure sign of Cytospora <coughs> canker. And Cytospora can also give evergreens kind of that grayish hue as well. And so I, I really think that we are dealing with the canker issue. Unfortunately, all you can do is, is cut those branches out. Um, if it's taken over enough of the tree, you may need to start thinking about a replacement tree. All right, and I'm sure she's not going to be happy to hear that. No, unfortunately not. All right, so this is also an Autumn Blaze question. John, this right. is for you. Um, she, this one has issues. That's really what she's telling us. So one side is dying. She's got some interesting things going on in the trunk. What are we going to say about this tree? I think it's time for last rites <laughs> on this tree. <laughs> so unfortunately, there's just lots of damage. Looks like there's been some damage to the trunk, to the you know, the, the bark, and it looks like there are some shelf fungi growing in one part of it. Uh, so uh, I think the damage has just been too much and that has allowed some, some other things to move in. So those shelf fungi aren't really causing damage. They're feeding on some of the damage that has already been caused. So I think this tree probably will need to be replaced sooner rather than later. All right, thank you, John. Well, it has been a fantastic season in our backyard farmer garden this year. Started, started strong, ended strong. Let's see what's happened in six months worth of time lapse in the backyard farmer garden.
in six short months if you have all the right people doing all the right things and a little help from above. So, Jim, you have your final okay. pictures of your final appearance oh, wow, on yes. Backyard yeah. Farmer. No. The first is these friendly guys were emerging from the chandelier near North Bend. What in the world okay. is going on with uh, that? They don't belong there, that's for sure. Um, those actually are rove beetles, uh, Bledius planipennis, and they tend to be a shoreline, like on a lake bed, the shoreline of a lake or pond. They feed on insects that would land on that shallow area where the sand is, and so they actually burrow into that sand. So I don't know how they end up being coming out of a chandelier, but that's what they are, Bledius palipennis. <laughs> and let's see, the other one? The second one is actually uh, two moths on the okay. outside walls. All right, yes. What are they? Okay, that one there is called a sigmoid prominent moth. And it's one singular adult female, and uh, she's pr pretty hairy looking. And then she's signaling for a male by sticking the tip of her abdomen out. And it's got a lot of wispy hairs there. That's how she signals for them to come. And uh, so she's not going to do much, much work beyond that point. So anyway, uh, and so they feed in willows and poplars and aspens. I don't know what the caterpillar looks like. It's probably like some kind of a looper of some kind. All right, interesting. Yeah. <laughs> okay, Bill, this is actually a viewer who has about six acres, beautiful, small square footage of turf that is a beautifully managed prairie, yep. immediately adjacent, wonders how to keep the prairie from invading the turf and how to keep the turf from invading the prairie. Yeah, exactly. This is a, it's just a classic example. It's something we deal with a lot on golf courses. Think about the native areas on a golf course and in Mullen, there's a lot of great golf courses that do the same thing. The biggest thing that we can do is water management. Those prairie plants do not want to be overwatered. If they're overwatered, they get a lot of production. They've had a lot of, of water in the sand hills this year, actually. So it's a lot of our primary production there. Uh, the bluegrass needs more water. So if we can make sure that irrigation is set up so that no excess water is going into that native area uh, and it's only staying on the bluegrass, that is one of the best things that, that we can do to keep them separated. Then uh, if you're looking for, you know, you're doing that, you're managing, uh, mowing can, can help a little bit, but some of those uh, native grasses, they struggle. There are some herbicides that can keep out the bluegrass in the prairie, like Cethoxidem um, is safe on prairie glass, but not safe on, on the bluegrass. That's one thing that we can do, or you could always do some type of a, an actual barrier between the two to try to keep them from doing that. But really focus on your water management first. All right, thank you, Bill. This is the first one we've had this year, uh, Kyle, for this. And this is uh, coneflowers seem to be sprouting mini coneflowers all over the flower itself. Beautiful. What is yeah. this? this <laughs> and is... how common is it? And what do you do about it? Yeah, and again, this is one of those things that we pathologists would call beautiful. But this is uh, aster yellows on prairie coneflower. And so very common with a lot of coneflowers. It's aster yellows is caused by a phytoplasma, and that's a bacteria that kind of behaves like a virus, but doesn't really know it's a bacteria. And really, we are one of the main spreaders of, of aster yellows. As we're going through our garden, doing any sort of pruning, trying to remove any, remove any dead tissue, if we're not making sure to clean off our pruners really well between hands, chances are we are spreading this phytoplasma all around the garden. The other thing that spreads this phytoplasma is a leaf hopper. And unfortunately, insecticides aren't the most effective in controlling aster yellows, primarily because it's really hard to control these leaf hoppers. They show up for a, a, an extended period of time and they, will, they would take repeated applications for really so, any sort of control. So the best thing you can do is once you see some of this phyllity, uh, which is when anytime you have floral tissue that turns into a leaf tissue, just remove that, remove those plants as soon as you can and make sure that you're cleaning your pruners between hand. All right, excellent, thank you, Kyle. All right, John, you have two vines that are um, ID and talk about the good, the bad, and the ugly. So here's your first picture. What is this one, good, bad, well, or both, ugly? They're both beautiful vines, but they act ugly sometimes. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, we have uh, sweet 
autumn clematis, mm -hmm. uh, which uh, is, uh, you know, we're used to those purpley ones that, that bloom, you know, in the late spring, early summer. This is a fall version. It has those lovely white flowers that are very fragrant. Uh, it's a very sweet, spicy, and sometimes I, can, I think it's a little overpowering. It can be like that sickly sweet smell. Uh, so that's what that is. The problem is in the warmer areas, it can actually be aggressive, verging on invasive. Uh, so it grows very aggressively. You have to keep it really, really pruned uh, where it will take over uh, different areas. And the second one is actually the seed pod of... So that's a, a trumpet vine. Mm -hmm. uh, so those are very interesting plants. They're great for pollinators, like um, uh, hummingbirds love them. Uh, it has those orangey red flowers on them. Uh, they, they have these interesting seed pods uh, that are unlike most other seed pods. It also can be on the invasive side. Uh, and uh, I have to add that, you know, where I'm, where I'm from, uh, in West Virginia, in the South, we have weird names for things. And so the colloquial name that we had for this was called devil shoelace, mm -hmm. right? So uh, that uh, sort of plays on the fact that it can, can be pretty invasive. Right, exactly. So beware with beware. both of those. Exactly. Well, we have one fabulous announcement as we close our season, and that would be the Harvest Ale Festival right here, October 13th, 1 to 5 p.m. at Midwest Hops Producers. All sorts of wonderful activities. We have a bit.ly on the screen and uh, that you'll be able to go to for more information on that. So the weather will be perfect, and so will the crowd for that one. All right, we have just a little bit of time left, I think, for some regular questions. Hey. So let's see, with you, Jim, let's go back to the strawberry question. Okay. Because you wanted to actually add yeah. to that one. Yeah, the history of that strawberry bed, I do not know, but it appears it may need some renovation. Uh, one of the things, I just happen to think that the crowns of the strawberry and the roots can be infested by a, a number of weevils, but primarily strawberry root weevils, so probably what that uh, resident found was uh, the weevil larvae. So when you reach that point uh, of having infested crowns and roots, it's, it's time to renovate. And then any kind of a pest that uh, can be controlled that's feeding on leaves or fruits, you have to m remember the pre-harvest interval. So you, you can only wait so much time before you harvest. So if you have a fairly fresh strawberry, it's almost impossible to, to treat it. But uh, pyrethrins are another, you know, the organic spray. Pyrethrins do not persist very long. So they'll give you at least one day of a, a waiting period to harvest for those fruits that are turning. All right. Thanks, Jim. Thank you. Still not great news, but maybe better. Mm -hmm. Maybe. Okay. So, Bill, this is actually a viewer who uh, saw an ad yep. for a, a fall fertilizer sounded really excellent and then read a little deeper into the label and the label said complete and it included a fertilizer, a weed control and some seed. Have you okay. heard of such a thing and is that a good idea? It can be. Um, this time of year if it's a if it's a starter fertilizer that's included with some seed, it's just still a good time to seed and so uh, you could use it in early fall. It might have a, a, um, a broadleaf weed control in there, which should probably be safe on those little seedlings. Um, I mean, I'm sure the manufacturers tested those things out. It'd be in the label, something would be different, but it can be fine. I wouldn't use it though later though. So early fall, and then if you want to fertilize later, you know, you do that October. Don't go too late in the fall anymore. That's an old recommendation around Halloween. Before that, you want to use just fertilizer, keep the seed out then. All right, thank you, Bill. All right, Kyle, uh, we have a viewer who sent us two pictures. One was actually beautiful, Rude Becky or Black-Eyed Susan. And right next to it was two weeks worth of all of a sudden really went downhill with black stems and spots on the leaves. Okay. What do we do? What is it and what do we do about yeah. that? Well, you know, it's hard to say what it is without really seeing it, but it could easily be what Phytophthora, one of our other, other root rots. Anytime we see it have that entire plant declining, over a pretty rapid period, chances are there's something wrong down below. And a lot of these root rots can also cause spots on the foliage too. So I would guess that's what's going on. Best thing you can do is get rid of those, um, get rid of the, the, the sick ones. Unfortunately, it may move over and uh, infest that, that healthy black-eyed Susan too. 
but really uh, sanitation is going to be your best friend and get rid of those. And if anybody wants to see what it looks like, come to campus. Yes. <laughs> All right, John, this is a really, we've never had this question. Okay, I'm, I hope I'm ready. <laughs> this is a South Sioux, or a Sioux City viewer. She wants to know whether pistachio shells will add acidity to the soil and can they be used as mulch? So you could probably use them as mulch if you ate a lot of pistachios, mm -hmm. right? You would, it would take a lot to be a mulch. Uh, but sort of adding those, those different organic amendments to the soil that change uh, the pH, a lot of that is sort of based in myth. So the, you, it's such a large volume of soil and its natural state, it always wants to sort of buffer itself. So it's always trying to get back to you know, whatever its normal is. So adding anything that it might you know, have a slight change in the pH, but it's always going to moderate itself back. So th even things like the pine needles and stuff like that, they don't have a big effect on pH. All right. And I like to buy my pistachios shelled. Right. So lazy. <laughs> right. Right. Lazy pistachios. Lazy pistachios. They taste better when you got to work for them. <laughs> right. Okay, right. Yeah, I know. Well, I know. <laughs> All right, Jim, uh, this is a viewer who had a heavy infestation of spotted wing drosophila three years ago in their raspberries, removed them completely, sodded. He's, one, he's wondering, did it go away, or will the mulberry trees that are also in the neighborhood keep the, yeah, uh, that darn insect around? Mulberries are indeed a, a host, but uh, there's other hosts as well. There's so many of them, any kind of a soft, thin-skinned fruit like blackberries and raspberries. And what happened was we had in, I think it was 2013, when we had this big uh, humongous infestation across the state affecting a lot of the raspberries and other berry crops and then all of a sudden it just seems like it's disappeared and we don't understand why but that can happen uh, they tend to favor shade and cooler temperatures and that might be one factor but it's always good to keep some kind of a trap up with your little jar with vinegar in it and some holes in it to see if you can see them prior to the ripening of your berries just in case uh, but generally speaking the numbers have been down over the last couple of years, so that's we're getting a break. All right, thanks, Jim. All right, Bill, uh, a lot of people like to seed this time of year. Some people like to sod. Yep. And the question from this viewer is, they see the sod come in in the big rolls. Yeah. Can you also get sod for small spaces that is in smaller smaller pieces, I guess? Yeah, I mean, you can, uh, you can order sod, and big roll sod is really convenient. That's why I do it for sports turf fields. They can even cut it six inches thick so they can play football on it right away. Um, but you can ask for smaller roll sod, usually about 10 square foot uh, smaller rolls, and you can always just cut them. So a sod harp or even just a, a knife, you can just cut the sod, fit it to shape, stick it on the ground, and you can sod all the way up until the snow flies or it's cold enough. So it's not as, as time uh, sensitive as say seeding would be. So if you miss seeding this year, and you can sod, sod it. All right, thanks, Bill. All right, Kyle, uh, we have downy mildew in the basil Ooh. in our backyard farmer garden, and we suspect in other parts of the state. Mm -hmm. What, what, what do we do about that uh, next year? Spray, spray, spray. Unfortunately, uh, downy mildew is very difficult to control once it's established. And the best thing you can do is to start those preventative fungicide applications before you even see it. So really knowing your site history is your best friend there. All right, mm. thank you so much. And maybe don't plant basil in the same spot. And maybe spot. don't plant basil, yeah. All right, buy it. Yes. All right, John, do you want to talk just a little bit about about aronia berries and whether they're good, bad, or ugly. So yeah, so we had a sample brought here. Oh, they're on the ground and I can't reach anymore. <laughs> uh, we're, we're way up here. Uh, so aronia berries are uh, one of the big new crops that are, that are coming into the area. Uh, very popular. Uh, they're very popular because they have a lot of antioxidants in them. Uh, and uh, they're, they're sort of a native of middle Europe, Europe. And so we have a perfect place here to grow them. Uh, and there's an emerging market, so we're going to see over the next few years how well we're doing, but we're, we're raising acres and acres and acres of them in Nebraska and, mid, and the Midwest and harvesting tens of thousands of pounds that are going to things like juices and jellies and jams. So you can grow them in the home garden. They make a nice uh, addition to the home garden. They have great fall foliage, uh, some nice flowers. They have these big uh, bluish purplish berries on them. Uh, the problem is that you can't really eat them fresh because they're so tart. Uh, and they're very tannic, they'll dry your mouth out, so you gotta add lots of sugar. All right, okay, thanks, John. Well, 
we do want to say thanks so much to Jim Kalish mm -hmm. for all these years of your service you. as one of the guys in the bug chair. Uh, one of the ones that gets all excited about it. This is, in fact, his last show. He has earned his retirement, which will be in January, we understand. This so, has been a wonderful pleasure to do this for so many years. I was thinking, like, m most regularly, probably 1995. And I think all of us share that same passion and interest for solving these problems in these specialty areas that we are so fascinated with. We laugh a lot about it, too. But uh, these are very real problems that you all have. My share happens to be insects, which I love, and that kind of thing. And so we're all glad to help. And before you know it, your term's over, guys. <laughs> Time to retire. <laughs> and unfortunately, on that note, our term is over, too. We have really enjoyed this season of Backyard Farmer. Every last minute, we've had a great audience, whether it's live or by everything else. Uh, I certainly want to take a, a minute and say thanks to our panel for not only another great show, but another great season. We could not do this without our partners from NET, all the camera crew, everybody in the trucks, everybody who shows up all the time to do every single thing, and certainly our producers, uh, Brock Lure and Brad Mills, Terry James, who manages the Master Gardeners, does that Backyard Farmer Garden, all those good things. So